thank you uh, for your participation in this venue. You're welcome. Good evening, Professor Dodi Subadi. How are you doing? Evening. Dr. Peter, fine. <laughs> Thank yeah, you very much evening. for your participation. <laughs> All of you. So we will uh, uh, get started in seven minutes. Okay. Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalili. Are you on the line? Good evening, Professor Hendy Hendarto. Are you on the line? Good evening, Dr. Franz Arifin. Good evening, Dr. Dia Asmarawati. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Peter. Yeah. Thank you for your contribution, uh, Dr. Dia. Good evening. Uh, sorry. Good afternoon, Professor Georges Zulfas from Greece. <coughs> Professor Georges Sulfas, are you on the line? Good evening, Professor Hendy Hendarto. Are you on the line? Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalili. Are you on the line?
Good afternoon, Professor Georges Zulfas. Are you on the line? Good evening, Professor Hendy Hendarto. Good evening. Oh, Good how, are you, how are you doing? Fine. Oh. Good evening, Hopefully. Dr. Peter. Hey. Hi, Dr. Franz. Uh, yes. Good, <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Professor Paul Tahalele. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to the International College of Surgeons Indonesia sections, the 14th chapter of the Surgical Forum today. And uh, my name is uh, Peter Johannes Manopo, General Surgeon. I am the coordinator of this Surgical Forum, and I will be your moderator. Uh, in the next session. First of all, on behalf of the ICS Indonesia section, I would like uh, to express my gratitude to uh, our guest speakers, Dr. Daniel Kokong from Nigeria. He is an ANT and head neck surgeon. Also to Professor Dodi M. Subadi, PhD, urologist from the ICS Indonesia section, and also to Dr. Desa Gede Agung Suprabawati, uh, oncologic surgeon from the ICS Indonesia section, and also to the World Congress of the ICS, Professor George Sulvas uh, from Greece, and the World Executive Officer from the ICS Global, Mr. Max uh, Donham, and the other Indonesian committee, the Section President, Professor Paul Tahlili, the Vice President, Professor Hendy Hendarto, and uh, the Secretary of this section, Dr. Francisco Arifin, and also uh, to the other committee, Dr. Dia Asmarawati, radiologist from the ICS Indonesia section. So uh, we come to the uh, opening session of this uh, chapter. For the first opportunity, I would like to invite the Indonesian section president, Professor Paul Tahlele, to deliver uh, the opening speech. Professor Paul Talili, the floor is yours. Uh, I will skip. Maybe later on he will join us. So uh, for the next, I would like to invite Professor Hendy Hendarto, uh, the Vice President of the ICS Indonesia section, 
to deliver the scientific notes. Professor Hendy and Darto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining the International Virtual Surgical Forum, Chapter 14, the International College of Surgeon Indonesian Section. Firstly, I would like to express my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Professor Paul Tahlili, Professor Sulfas, Mr. McDonham, and also the speaker today, Dr. Daniel Damasau Kokong, Professor Dodi Subadi, Dr. Desa Suprabawati, and also Dr. Diaz Marawati and the host, Dr. Peter Manopo and Dr. Franz Arifin, and all the webinar participants. The webinar topic today is uh, surgical knowledge and skill. And from the scientific note, I inform the opinion from General Surgery News, March the 9th, 2021, with the title is the Robotic Surger Surgery, the Javu All Over Again, written by Dr. Edward Felix. He is a surgeon and also the editor at the sorry, board of General Surgery News. He talked about advantages and disadvantages of robotic surgery. And in the last paragraph of his writing, he showed a study published in JAMA Surgical 2020 concluded, no clinical benefit to the robotic approach to straightforward inguinal hernia repair compared with the laparoscopy approach. The robotic approach incurred higher costs and more operative time compared with laparoscopic approach. This is debatable, but it is a fact. That's all I think about the scientific note. I hope we all stay healthy and stay safe. And finally, thank you for all speakers for sharing your experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hendy Hendarto, for your scientific notes. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Professor Georgit Sulfas, the world president of the ICS. Professor Georgit Sulfas, the floor is yours. Uh, maybe later on he will join us. Uh, Professor Paul Tahalele, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I will skip and I would like to invite uh, Mr. Max Downham, the World Executive Officer of uh, the International College of Surgeons from the headquarters Chicago, uh, US. Mr. Uh, Mr. Max Downham, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hi. Manopo. Uh, I, uh, I commend, as I always do, uh, very sincerely so, the Indonesian section, uh, the uh, of the International College of Surgeons, the leaders uh, in the Indonesian section, including you, Dr. Manopo, uh, for these webinars. Um, the vision uh, of the International College of Surgeons is uh, to improve the lives of uh, the patients of our fellows around the world. And uh, you certainly are doing that by through our, our uh, missions of education, communications and leadership. So uh, in brief, I, I on behalf of uh, uh, Professor Giorgio Sufas, who is our world uh, president of the International College of Surgeons based in Thessaloniki, Greece, and the other leaders of the college, uh, I sincerely commend you. And uh, really, uh, I, what you're doing is just fantastic. And uh, I want that to be known. Uh, the, uh, a couple of comments. Number one, uh, uh, as many of you know, the International College of Surgeons has uh, an official relationship with the World Health Organization as a non-governmental organization or NGO. And this year, the WHO has declared th this year to be the year of nurses. And part of the International College of Surgeons is a really terrific uh, museum uh, in Chicago, which is a division of the ICS. Uh, in, the museum is the International Museum of Surgical Science. And this week uh, we opened a, an exhibit uh, in respect to nurses uh, and the nursing profession around the world 
uh, in uh, accord with the WHO uh, declaration. So uh, we had about 100 people at the opening reception. And for those of you who don't know, uh, on a pre-COVID basis, uh, and we are recovering very rapidly, uh, we have about 40,000 people a year pass through our museum. Um, so we're very proud of that exhibit. We do that in conjunction with the Hectone Institute, um, and uh, which is founded by Cook County Hospital and physicians at Rush Medical in Chicago. Uh, the other point that I mentioned just briefly, uh, as Dr. Manop and I were speaking before the uh, start of this uh, webinar is that the International College of Surgeons 42nd World Congress uh, is scheduled to be conducted in Bangkok, um, Thailand, uh, with the governmental meetings being November 15, 16 uh, this year, and the Scientific Congress uh, November 17 through 19 uh, this year. Uh, we have every intention at this time to conduct a physical uh, uh, assembly, in-person assembly uh, for the governance meetings and to participate in the Congress that's being organized so very well by the Thailand section. Um, that of course is dependent upon how the COVID-19 and mutations thereof uh, occur, but we're monitoring the situation. But at this time, we have every intention of uh, going to Bangkok and to uh, having an in-person meeting. Um, so again, I close on behalf of Professor Sufas and the other leaders of the International College of Surgeons. Uh, we commend you, uh, the leaders of the Indonesian section, the participants in this session, uh, Dr. Kokang, uh, Sabati, Dr. Sabati, uh, Dr. Suprabawati, uh, Dr. Arifin, Dr. Hindarti, uh, and Hindarto, excuse me, and to Dr. Asmarati uh, for conducting this session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Max Donham, for your updates of ICS. Uh, Professor Paul Tahalili, are you on the line? Professor George Solvas, are you on the line? So for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Francisco Arifin, the Indonesian section uh, secretary, to deliver the business uh, notes of the Indonesian section. Dr. Franz Arifin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Peter. Can I share the screen? Can the, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, I think it's still disabled from the uh, organizer. Mr. Bimo, uh, would you like to open the screen share? Sorry, it's still disabled. Mr. Bimo, please open the share screen for Dr. Franz. Uh, okay, anyway, um, it's okay, Dr. Peter. I will uh, try to uh, uh, inform, uh, to give the information uh, uh, verbally because I still cannot share the screen. First of all, uh, the uh, Central Committee of the ICS would like to uh, say that uh, we are uh, in Indonesia, we are entering the uh, fasting month, the Ramadan month. So we would like to uh, say that uh, we hope that uh, we can still uh, be able to uh, work together and of course uh, we uh, apologize for our uh, uh, mistakes as uh, usual and habitual as in, in Indonesia uh, for the uh, uh, Ramadan and fasting month. The second one is that uh, we have an invitation for the neck, head and neck summit on parotid gland malignancies, which is which will be performed on the 21st of April uh, uh, at uh, sorry uh, by the uh, Philippine uh, uh, section, the International College of Surgeons of the Philippine section. Uh, you you can find the invitation and the link. Uh, 
uh, for registration in the uh, our uh, WhatsApp group. So uh, uh, we would like to invite uh, to extend the uh, invitation to all of the uh, ICS members. This excuse me, Doctor Franz. You can yeah. uh, share the screen right now. Oh, can I? Okay. So sorry, it's just a moment. Is it shown? Okay, this is the invitation yeah. for the Philippine section. So all of the members of Indonesian sections is invited for this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, so uh, we uh, would endorse and encourage everybody to join the meeting of this uh, 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 from the Philippine section. And uh, the last one, uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, reminder for us, what is the uh, vision and mission of the International College of Surgeons? So our mission is uh, to foster the worldwide surgical excellence through education, training, fellowship, and humanitarian efforts. Uh, this is the uh, one that we should always remember. Uh, all of everything that we do uh, is in accord to the this mission and uh, uh, i'd like to also uh, quote from max torex uh, the founder of international college of surgeon that uh, there is no human calling which demands from those who follow it a greater endowment of the best human qualities and the highest development of technical knowledge and skills than the art of surgery of course the art of surgery includes every every and uh, everyone and everybody who uh, do the surgery uh, directly or support the surgery. So we would like to invite everybody in the uh, International College of Surgeon, especially in the Indonesian section, to uh, uh, advance and to uh, better to be better in performing and uh, giving the surgical service to everybody. I think that is all, Dr. Peter, for uh, from the Secretariat, and uh, I return the time to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Franz Arifin, for your uh, section notes. On now we come to the scientific session. For the first opportunity, I would like uh, to invite uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Dodi M. Subadi, PhD, urologist. Uh, for delivering your presentation on challenging decision in complex and high risk prostate disorders. Professor Dodi M. Subadi, the floor is yours. Dr. Franz, would, oh yeah, okay. Would you like to take down the share screen, uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Bimo? Uh, Professor Dodi? Yes. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter Malopo. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank to the organizing committee, to the ICS innovation section, uh, especially Dr. Peter Malopo and others, and Mr. Max Downham, who <clears throat> welcomed me in this uh, meeting. I would like to share screen. In this occasion, I would like to share uh, my experience in treating prostate disorders, especially the uh, BPH or benign prostate hyperplasia. This is my disclosure. Uh, the agenda will be uh, first the facts and then the available and the best practice, uh, what uh, I did and I will do uh, in Surabaya. The facts are that prostate is a normal gland in every uh, uh, man and there 
are normal size in teenage years and then continue to grow and grow and grow until uh, in the later life. And the last, the most common uh, symptoms of PPH is lower urinary tract symptoms, especially in aging men. And the prevalence of PPH and LUTs increasing will be more than 80% in the aging male, more than 80 uh, years old. And from the economic standpoint, there are uh, many points that we can account that uh, millions of office visits and hundreds of thousand hospitalization and also uh, loss of productivity in uh, our <clears throat> society. Let's have uh, the nomenclature of the benign prostate. The hyperplasia actually means that after we have a pathologic anatomical uh, examination, the hyperplasia of pathologic examination. And the enlargement, we call it the BPE, benign prostate enlargement. And if there is an obstruction, then the BPO or benign prostate obstruction. But in every day, we uh, simple say it as a BPH. This is the history of treatment of the BPH. That the first resectoscope, this is uh, one of the first endoscope used in the surgery. It was in the year uh, 1926. And then it's still uh, developed, but in 1945, it's very popular, the open simple prostatectomy, the million prostatectomy. This is a very, very good uh, uh, surgery. I love it, yeah. And then this is, these are all the development of prostate uh, disorder treatment, especially for the benign disease. And, and this year, we uh, developed the first alpha blocker, the first uh, medical treatment for prostate. And then the second uh, uh, most uh, prescribed uh, medical treatment is the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And then coming the, the laser treatment for the prostate and robotic and so on and so on. From uh, our association, Indonesian Urological Association, there is uh, guidelines. And the latest revision was in 2017. And we could see here that for benign prostate hyperplasia or enlargement, there are so many medical treatments. Before medical treatment, we have the conservative treatment, means that uh, the watchful waiting or active surveillance. Uh, it is the meaning is that uh, we could uh, advise the patient for uh, lifestyle modification. And then the first line of medicamentous uh, treatment is the alpha blocker, and then the five alpha reductase inhibitor, also PD5 inhibitor and the combination but before the patient come to the doctor, usually they already have the phytotherapy over the counter or from their friends. And then the surgery. The gold standard of benign prostate enlargement treatment surgically is TURP, transurethral <coughs> section of the prostate. Then others are follow the enucleation, laser, microwave, uh, radio frequencies, stand, and so on, and so on. But still we have the beauty of the open surgery, the open simple uh, prostatectomy. And there are some uh, very special conditions for prostate treatment, like the TWOC, trial without catheter, after the first event of urinary uh, <coughs> retention or the CIC, clean intermittent catheterization, the cystostomy, and the indwelling catheter. Let's see, this is the guideline from the Europe. We could see that there are two main treatments, the medical treatment and the surgical treatment. Yeah. And the point is that if we see the guide, this guideline from Europe, 
that the medical treatment can be used from the mild moderate symptoms until the severe large symptoms but there's a limit the limit is acute urinary retention so when we have to perform surgery in this kind of uh, patient with uh, LUTs and due to BPH, we have a very beautiful uh, picture here, the efficacy versus the risk in benign prostate enlargement. First is the phytotherapy. This is before, uh, usually before the patient came to the doctor. And the second is 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and then uh, the alpha blocker, the thermotherapy, uh, we use uh, heat to shrink the prostate, either with uh, microwave or with uh, radio frequency, and then came the laser. Many kinds of laser, many developments of laser. We will talk about that later. And then the gold standard, the TURP, still gold standard up to now. <laughs> And the open prostatectomy is still there, it's still needed, especially for big prostate, although we could also try to do uh, endoscopic surgery, either with URP or laser for big prostate, but the most beautiful uh, treatment actually for big prostate, more than 80 grams is open prostatectomy. And then the technology coming, the urethra lift, the uro lift, and the vapor treatment. This is the demarcation of medical treatment and surgical treatment. The problem with the TURP, the gold standard for BPH treatment, this is for decades, the gold standards. But still, simple prostatectomy if the prostate is bigger. It's very highly effective, but not without morbidities. The TURP, a recurrence rate of 15% after five to 10 years. And in this one study, more than uh, 10,000 patients undergoing TURP, the surgical reoperation in six months, about 5.6% and transfusion about 3% and the TUR syndrome is one and a half percent. What is the TUR syndrome? It is because that we use uh, water so the risk of turp we could list here bleeding if the bleeding is uh, <clears throat> much red the retention of the blood clot perforation of the bladder or of the prostate urosepsis tur syndrome and death postoperatively erectile dysfunction retrograde ejaculation and urethral stricture How about the prolonged medical therapy? The impact of medical therapy on transurethral resection of the prostate. This is a, a one study that in 16% increase the rate of related effects of BPH for the surgery. If we delay because of the medical therapy. In 10 years period from 1988 to 19. 98, 60% decrease of TRP means that the TRP is decreasing the frequency the urologist doing TRP until 60% because of the medical treatment, because the patient asked for medical treatment first. And previous medical management had failed in 36%. And there is a significantly different in acute urinary retention. Yeah. Uh, formerly, before the medical therapy, it's only 23% the acute urinary retention. After uh, the use of medical therapy worldwide, then the acute urinary retention is about a half of the patient, 55%. And the upper tract uh, obstruction, obstruction is 12.5%. Comparing with before the medical therapy, it's only 5.3%. So the conclusion that it has been a dramatic decrease in the number of TRP because of the medical therapy. The proportion of TRP patients presenting with urinary 
uh, retention and hydronephrosis is increasing at the time of the TRP after medical therapy. Now we talk about the endoscopic surgical techniques. Either a con, uh, the, the, the first one is the URP, we could, we could do with the electrocautery uh, resection, enucleation, vaporization. All these three can be replaced with a laser. Then alternative ablative techniques with other uh, agent and non ablative techniques. And we come here, we could make uh, three big blocks. This is the URP and open prostatectomy, the gold standards. Then come the, uh, the heat therapy the, with microwave, with radio frequency, or with uh, hot vapor water treatment. Then laser, reducing the uh, prostatic carcinoma with laser to uh, replace the electrocautery. And the other uh, instruments are prostatic stents, ureter lift, and in the study also ethanol injection and botulinum toxin, but this is a very, in, in a very rare uh, situation. What is available now? First, back to the issue, medical versus surgical. Most of the old patient, they will try to get the medical. But actually, the medical treatment is in a, in a very limited uh, result comparing with the surgical treatment. For surgical treatment, the endoscopic uh, treatment, TURP, electrocautery versus laser. And there are some issues of anticoagulantia because of the old age uh, patient. They tend to got anticoagulantia, especially after introducing of the uh, coronary stenting. And it developed the MIST, minimally invasive surgical treatment for prostate. And this is one of the uh, could be fatal uh, TURP syndrome in elderly patient. Yeah. And that's why if the patient is getting old, then we perform a TURP, then the risk of Tour syndrome is increasing. The rate is below 1%, but if it has happened, then it's very troubling. And then after medical treatment, the patients are getting old, then the chronic disease is increasing. The hypertension, COPD, diabetes mellitus, and also stroke. Yeah. Other risk factors are smoker, obesity, and also the chronic condition because of the alcohol consumption. This is uh, our uh, experience, uh, all experience with the heating of the prostate with a tuna. Tuna is a transurethral needle ablation. Uh, we use the radio frequency to hit the prostate like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, with this kind of special uh, needle, with this uh, radio frequency, and it could be uh, <coughs> uh, better, the patient with the symptoms, and the Qmax of the Euroflomet is also uh, better, but for after several weeks, and it is, it's uh, have a, uh, limited uh, time, maybe only, or only for small prostate and not for the middle lobe of hypertrophy and also only for less than uh, 10 years. Uh, it's about three to five years. This is the picture of the endoscopic surgical techniques. We could use also with the electrocautery, the enucleation, and this is the resection with electrocautery, but we can use both of this with a laser. Yeah. And also the vaporization. We could use uh, the electrocautery for vaporization, but better with a laser uh, vaporization. These are the most popular lasers for prostate. 
the green light or KTP laser, the diode laser, the holmium, and the newest is the tulium laser. What are the difference? The difference is that first diode and NDX laser, the penetration is very deep. Yeah, it means that if we want to laser prostate here, either to resect or enucleation, then the effect of heat is very deep. It is a half centimeter or five millimeters. More superficial is with the KTP or LBO or green light laser. Why it called green light? Because it's a visible light. Yeah, it's a very beautiful green for the green light laser. And then this is the holmium. It is uh, more ideal because it's very superficial, only uh, 0.4 millimeter, and the tulium only 0.2 millimeter. It means that it is like the electrocautery. So it can uh, incise or resect only 0.2 millimeter. This is our early uh, experience in Surabaya with green light laser. It's very beautiful. The laser, you could, you could see the laser fiber here glowing in uh, uh, green light. And this is uh, the systematic uh, vaporization of the prostate. Yeah. And this is the, the green light. You could see that the laser is firing at the prostate. Yeah, it looks like this. And then the vaporization is going on. How about the tulium and holmium? It's very superficial. So it incises like our electrocautery, but without bleeding. Amazing. In size and coagulation at the same time. And the technology is going the Eurolift. Eurolift is this is the prostate, not too big prostate. We could introduce a scope here, a very special rod. And then from this scope, we could place a, a metal, like a cable, like this. And then the prostate is tightened like this in four or three or six or eight places. So the uh, urethra prostatica is bigger. And this is the picture of tuna or radio frequency heating with a special needle. Yeah. It develops a heat here and the necrosis that we have to wait several weeks also in this uh, water vapor therapy it's actually a hot water vapor introduced here with a special needle and then the process is going on the necrosis of the parenchyma okay. yeah and some uh, several places and then the patient have to wait the maximum uh, effect better effect is after three months because we have to uh, wait until the necrosis and shrinking of the prostate like this. And there's the problem with anticoagulantia in elderly patient because of the cardiac condition. With the laser, we could continue the non-interrupting the oral antiplatelet or anticoagulant. Yeah? Because uh, usually for TURP with electrocautery, we have to stop the anticoagulant for one week. In resume, we could see here that we have to assess the prostate size first. If the prostate is very large, then the choice is simple prostatectomy or holmium laser enucleation or tulium laser. The prostate is not so big in average from 40 to 80 gram. Then we could use from Holep until aqua auto or vapor or TURP. But what is the best up to now is the Holep holmium uh, laser enucleation for the prostate or the tulium. 
because it gives a minimal bleeding and it could use also for bigger prostate. And in, in complicated patients, such as anticoagulant treatment, we still could use the holmium green light and the tulium uh, laser for the treatment. So the best practice is that first, this is the challenge for the doctor. We have to have a good interaction between patient and doctor. The relationship must be good to make a choice whether it is a medical treatment for long time or a surgical treatment. And most important is the satisfaction of the patient with, the, with our treatment. And we have to warn the patient that older age means that if the patient has to be operated or uh, sur surgery, then the risk is increasing. The doctor also overweight the considerate to consider the scale and the facility. So the summary is that surgical treatment is performed where drug treatment is fails. Yeah. But patients are older. When surgical intervention consider comorbidities is more. The treatment goals of BPH not only to relieve floods, but also to prevent adverse events related to BPH, that is acute urinary retention, renal function uh, decreasing, or bladder dysfunction. So the patient who underwent immediate TURP had a greater improvement in urophlometry in the flow of the, the urine flow and the, the symptoms score than if we wait until uh, the medical treatment is filled. And the complication also less than if we continue with the medical treatment until the patient is very old. So the gold standard needs a renewal, a new technique, assist by the technology. We need the evidence. And then maybe we can get a new gold standard. The ideal laser for prostate should be equally effective and durable as the URP, universally adapted, less adverse effects, less bleeding, less required for anesthesia, shorter hospital stay, if possible, should be cheaper. Uh, this is impossible. So this is the choice of the laser, the holmium, tulium, green light, and di diode. But these two laser, holmium and tulium, are uh, almost ideal because uh, comparable to TURP and uh, for all size of the prostate. Uh, this is an example that we uh, do the tulium laser. We could do uh, enucleation or vaporization or vaporization. So what is the message? Choose the right instrument for the right patient and as early as possible if the patient uh, <clears throat> or would like to have a surgery. Thank you. Thank you per very much, uh, Professor Dodi M. Subadi, <laughs> for your nice presentation. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Daniel Damasau Kokong, uh, the ENT and head neck uh, surgeon from the ICS Nigeria section. Dr. Daniel Damasau Kokong will speak about the approach in facio-cervical trauma. Uh, Dr. Daniel Kokong, the floor is yours. Dr. Daniel Kokong. All right. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, come on, connect me. Um, let me share my screen now. Share my screen. Uh, please share your screen. Yes. Yes. I'm about to share the screen now. Please share screen. <laughs> Yes, 
Yes. Am I am I visible now? Yes, but uh, please uh, display the full screen expose. Yes, thank you. It's clear okay. now. Okay, am I okay now? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to appreciate um, ICS Indonesia section, especially Dr. Peter Ioannis Manuku for this honor and uh, the president of uh, Indonesia section of ICS, uh, Professor Paul Taha, for this great opportunity. I want to also thank uh, Dr. Mark Downham and the executive director of ICS Global United States for this opportunity to uh, make this presentation. And of, of course, the world president of ICS, uh, President Giorgio Sulfas. Um, this is, um, I am a member of the American Academy of Special Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. I'm also a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, of course, as uh, Dr. Dalham, Dalham is aware, they gave me the other appointment, a member of Research and Scholarship Standing Committee. And I'm a nominee for the 2021 World Foundation Prize in Medicine. The World Foundation is located in Herzliya, in Israel. Um, this is a quote that I want us to share as I present approach in uh, facial cervical trauma. About one person dies of head injury every five minutes in the US. The implication is that in the last 12 years, that statement was made by the president of the Neurological Society of the United States in 1989. That means that in the past 12 years, the number of deaths from head injury is equivalent to the military threats in all the wars fought by these nations this nation since 1776. And the cost implication is about 25 billion US dollars yearly. That was a statement by Generali in 1989. And uh, this other um, quote, I would like to make it that beauty isn't a con con cultural constru construct, but rather a part of universal human nature. Uh, that, that is the evolutionary psychology perspective. Uh, why I have to bring this is um, because of the concept of uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Now, that is the front gate of the University of Jos, uh, where I serve as a Senate member and a senior lecturer and head of the department of A, Nose and Throat, Head and Neck Surgery. And that is the teaching hospital, the Joss University Teaching Hospital, where I work as an honorary consultant ENT surgeon. So those are the, uh, the items I will want to talk about, and I will uh, conclude in a moment. Now, by introduction, the face is intimately, intimately related to self-image. Now, um, facial cervical trauma, there are some synonyms, either craniofacial and neck trauma, or head face neck trauma, or maxillofacial and neck trauma, they are all synonyms. Now, the face is a source of most curiosity to scientists and researchers, uh, because we, uh, we have found that we, one can get a lot of information from looking at somebody's face. And uh, passive attractiveness has also been shown to activate certain brain regions, which is uh, dopaminergic uh, nucleus activants. Now, what we are saying here is that um, in class or in the school, children that are perceived to be attractive, they tend to attract, you know, lesser punishment for the, for the same offense with those that are perceived to be unattractive. Also, the people of the force, you know, if you are driving and the law enforcement agents are on the highway and they stop you, if you are attractive or you are, you are perceived to be attractive, they tend to allow you go 
And then while the person that is, uh, is perceived not to be attractive uh, tends to suffer. Also in politics and in the judiciary. So the face is critical. That is why we are discussing this. Uh, so that the approach is to have someone uh, with a face that is uh, near pre-morbid state. Okay, so the bones of the facial skeleton are a key determinant of facial appearance. Now, although the management of the airway and the cardiovascular system take precedence in trauma care, facial injuries demand attention because of their potential for a long-term impact on quality of life. Now, Charles Darwin in 1871 was one of the scientists or, or, the, or one of the evolutionary psychologists that did a lot of studies on human beauty. And he concluded that, universe, that there is no universal standard of beauty. Until in 1985, Samuels and the Langworths, they found out that people that were perceived to be uh, attractive and were presented to three months and three and six month year old infants, you know, they tended to look longer. So uh, with that, it, it implies that even children or infants can discriminate attractive uh, faces. So we can say with absolute certainty that facial cues that yield judgments of beauty seem invariant across different cultures. So the concept of beauty is in the eyes of beholder um, is an all adage. This is a rating of beauty by the University of Michigan in, in, in 1971, uh, from grade one to grade, uh, grade five to grade one, strikingly handsome or beautiful to, to homely. Now, the beautiful thing again here is that uh, the human remains especially the bones of the skull, they tend to live for a long period and they have been used, you know, to identify deceased personalities or deceased persons in homes that might have lost their beloved ones and then they wanted to investigate and find out. And of course, of course in crime detection, okay. um, forensic facial approximation and forensic facial reconstruction, so the human score is very critical. Um, the, it is easily the most subjective, that is um, facial uh, forensic reconstruction. Very controversial, but it's a very fascinating area of science. So historically, mid-facial fractures were commonly classified according to the first system, uh, but um, it had been described several uh, thousands of years before he was born as uh, described by uh, the described in the Smith papyrus uh, uh, documentation by 2500 BC. Um, the René Lefort's uh, description of 1901 was he got uh, 32 cadaveric heads and subjected them to different forces. And he found out that most of the time, the bones of the skull are being spared. And he was able to describe and found uh, three weak lines, which he used to describe his uh, system, uh, Lefort one to three. Um, and then in 1993, uh, Mastiani described and modified the Lefort system into one to four with subset. So facial bone in isolation are comparatively fragile, but they gain strength when they articulate. And that is what we call the concept of facial buttresses. Uh, mid facial fractures are typically caused by blunt traumas. And the fracture of the nose are the most frequent in all facial fractures and are reported to be the third most common in the human skeleton. And as we are aware, the nose is critical in the human appearance or in the beautiness or the beauty or handsomeness of an individual. It contributes about 50 to 60 percent. Now, mandibular fractures uh, contribute, um, uh, they are the second most commonly fractured facial bone, 
and the third of the human skeleton, half of facial fractures affect the nasal bone. Now, in terrorism, usually they use explosives, and the explosives are meant to cause confusion uh, because of the loud noise which disorients the, the victim. Uh, usually, bones are aimed to kill, but if they cannot, they should, uh, you know, they are intended to inflict maximum panic, pain, and disfigurement. And so, IEDs usually affect the ear, nose, and throat. Okay, because the sharpness tends to spray upwards. Um, there was a study that was done in the United States by American team of PNT surgeons in who is to, become, is to be included in the trauma team. Um, because traditionally, the trauma team used to include the neural surgeon, the ophthalmic surgeon, and the oral surgeon. So inclusion of the ENT head and neck surgeon actually was found to improve outcome. And so we appeal to uh, people of the force here, or people in policy making, to look at that concept. Now, penetrating neck trauma, historically, they carry high mortality. And this brings us to the concept of selective versus mandatory neck exploration. The dividing line between the high velocity and low velocity is uh, the speed of 610 meters per second while either close range or, uh, or long range is uh, five meters. And um, the most lethal missile are high velocity projectors that impact all their energy into the tissues without ex exiting. And that is V2 equals to zero. And these are tumbling missiles, expanding bullets, explosive bullets, like the barrel bombs in, uh, in Syria. And of course, is the injury severity score that we use. And uh, Salinas et al. Uh, uh, described massive facial trauma as a trauma of the face involving three or more facial aesthetic units. Now, the real, the overall goal of managing craniofacial trauma is to restore functional occlusion to stabilize the major facial skeletal support, thereby restoring the pre-mobile three-dimensional control, that is the height, the width, and the projection, and then restore facial symmetry and avoid scarring, and which informs the use of appropriate sutures when one is uh, suturing the wounds of the face. So pre pre preservation of mid-facial structure is dependent on vertical buttresses. Okay, while mid facial aesthetics, one has to concentrate on the horizontal uh, buttresses. Now, these are the relevant anatomy of the facial skeleton. Of course, the upper third is the frontal bone, the middle third, which is the mid face, is the maxilla and its component, and the lower third is the mandible, and which is covered by a soft tissue. Uh, that is the, those are the facial aesthetics of units and units, okay? So the face and the neck uh, constitute nine facial subunits. So as a, uh, so any, uh, any uh, you know, attempt to secure and to treat facial injuries, one has to take cognizance of these uh, units and subunits. And then of course, these are diagrams, you know, showing the uh, facial aesthetic units the nose has its own special ones again. And of course, we can see the rule of uh, fifth facial proportions. And then, uh, and then the vertical and the horizontal rule of third proportions. The angles of the faces, including the uh, nasofrontal, nasolabia. So these are things that, has, that have to be considered when one is managing cases of uh, facial trauma. Uh, of course, uh, we can see other diagrams. The nose and the ear, they lie in parallel, and the length of the pinna is the, carries the equivalent length with the nose. So those are factors that must be considered. Uh, the ear protrudes at an angle of 30 to 20 to 30 degrees, uh, which is about 15 to 25 millimeters away from the helix. And the pinna is parallel to the nose, and then the length of the pinna is equal to the length of the nose. 
Okay, of course, these are the facial layers. Uh, this is the facial, uh, the cranium and facial skeletal framework, the frontal bone, the middle face, and then the mandible. These are the facial vertices that I discussed uh, earlier on the horizontal vertices and then the vertical vertices. And what we said earlier was that the horizontal vertices they are concerned with aesthetics, while structure and stability are the vertical vertices. And of course, that is the nose, the, the skeletal uh, framework of the nose. As you know, we use the bones and then the upper and the lower lateral cartilages in rhinoplasty. And of course, the nose, uh, the septum is there. The most um, nasal fractures, they are accompanied with um, septal dislocation. Uh, wherever the septum goes, the nose goes. So if somebody has a crooked nose uh, post-trauma, the septum has to be checked. Um, of course, the mandible, uh, this is to, uh, about uh, fractures of the mandible. There, is, um, a, there are forces between the anterior and the posterior group of muscles that attach the mandible. And the fracture line in relation to this muscle determine whether that fracture is going to be a favorable one or unfavorable. The favorable one, the reduction is close reduction, while the unfavorable one is um, uh, open reduction, which is a difficult one. Now we can see the statistics here in um, um, uh, mandibular bone fractures. Uh, the commonest uh, part of the mand mandible that is fractured is the angle of the mandible as shown there and then followed by the body, then the paracentesial uh, para and the ramus. Um, then, of course, the triangles of the neck, they're also equally important uh, because you cannot attempt to uh, treat, uh, penetrate the neck without paying attention to the triangles of the neck because knowledge of this aims uh, at uh, communication across uh, scholars if I say anterior triangle or I say subclavian triangle, uh, I, you are, one is expected to know the structures that are there. And then Rune and Christensen, they brought up the, con the, the concept of uh, zones of the neck. Uh, the zone one and zone three, they are the most terrible uh, penetrating injuries there. They usually carry a high mortality. Um, now, road traffic crashes are the nine causes of death and expected to be the seventh. Uh, it is estimated worldwide that 3,300 people die each day from road traffic crashes. And 90% of road traffic casualties, they come from the developing nation. Southeast Asia and Western Pacific, uh, I'm sorry to say that Indonesia, they constitute two thirds of trauma cases. Uh, Indonesia here, and that is Jakarta, and of course that is Surabaya here, uh, where ICS uh, Secretariat in uh, Indonesia is. And of course we can see the countries that constitute that. We can see the Western Pacific, the countries, the Philippines, and so on and so forth. And now, um, the, it is estimated that by the year 2030, motor uh, vehicular accidents will be a cause of uh, disability adjusted life uh, years in the world, ranked third. And then that was what led to the 2010 decision of the World Health Organization for the declaration of a decade of action for road safety. And uh, 2011 to 2020, and of course, uh, on reaching 2020, then the pandemic, and it has been uh, predicted that uh, road, traffic, road traffic crashes is our new additional pandemic. Uh, we have seen also here that alcohol and drug, they constitute 50 uh, risk factors for 50% of traumas, and the victims come with a severe lipid fracture. And we did a study on admissions into ICU and found out that uh, the head and neck constitute three quarters you know, of uh, the, the injured. And of course, we did a study on explosion on, on terrorism and bodies involved. 
we found out that the mid facial region and the mandibular regions are the second most first and the second most common. And of course, the global losses related to road traffic caches estimated at 518 billion, uh, which cost each most countries one to three percent of their GDP. And um, deaths and disability for international terrorism accounts for less than 2%, yet the global economic loss is estimated at 12.7 trillion since the declaration of the war on terror by President George W. Bush in 2001, this amount of money that has been sent, spent so far. So who is at risk? The young people, of course, we can see there um, on safe roads and so on and so forth, over speeding, and then distracted driving, um, unsafe vehicles, inadequate post-crash care. And of course, we see some of the uh, risk factors for penetrating injuries, which are gunshot wounds. And of course, uh, the main factors that determine is the projectile strike is the terminal ballistic, which determines the wounding capacity. And these are the factors. Uh, kinetic energy, the projectile, and then the composition of the tissue involved. And of course, this is a diagram showing the characteristic of projectile, tumbling, deformation, and fragmentation. Of course, um, uh, these are uh, the most little missiles impact of their energy into the tissue without exiting. Of course, uh, that is why uh, an, an injury uh, from uh, from a from a missile that is uh, very little, we usually have no uh, exit points. Um, so these are the seven potential mechanisms of injury uh, by blasts, either through interaction, uh, blast pressure, acoustic and thermal injury, release of toxics, and of course primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Now, um, the classification, how do we classify facial injuries? Uh, upper third, middle third, and lower third, and the neck. And of course, zone one contains the visceral structure as well as the, of the neck. And of course, as I mentioned earlier on, it is they are the most deadly because injuries there, you know, uh, you know they ha it carries high mortality. Of course, uh, these are some of the features um, who might see a visible fracture, bleeding from the nose. Patient can come with headache, depressed fractures of the frontal region and uh, bleeding. Of course, this is a hollow sign. If someone is bleeding from the nose, uh, you get a blot, blotting paper. And then if there is a cerebral spinal fluid and it drops there, uh, you'll be able to see and uh, know that there is a drainage of CSF. Of course, this is a, a, a victim of a road traffic accident, the frontal bone fracture. Um, now, um, nasal fractures are very key because um, majority of the fractures of the face, the nose is involved. ENT classified nasal fractures into three, the Chevalier, the Jajave, and then the nasocubital ethmoid. And the classical thing about the nasal cubital ethmoid is that uh, there is a depression of the nasal bridge and a pig nose deformity, and is the most uh, severe form of um, uh, facial fractures. And this is a simple um, gradient here, um, one to five. Uh, of course, these are some of the presentation: black eye, bleeding, um, dish face deformity, telecantos. Epiphoral visual disturbance. This is a case of uh, uh, mid facial uh, in, uh, fractures with um, injury in the base, base of the skull with the raccoon eye. We know of the raccoon animal, uh, which is a small, uh, uh, a small animal that has this kind of appearance, dark patches below the, the eye. Uh, so this classic, classical presentation, we call it the raccoon eye. The orbital blowout fracture, you have uh, you know, uh, an object that is spherical that hits the ball at the eye, and then pressure building in the eye, and then the middle border of the eye gives, gives way into the ethmoid, and then uh, the, 
the maxillary sinus. So these are the lipos one to three, the fractals, the fractal lines. And, um, and this is the Makayani classification of lipos fractal one to four with uh, subsets. And uh, of course, uh, these are the classical uh, presentation of the lipos fractures, ecchymosis, mobility of the maxilla, and so on and so forth, and the uh, elongation of the face, malocclusion. And this presentation is very classical for each of these um, uh, this, uh, lipos fractures. A mobile or floating maxilla is seen in the fourth one, step deformity or, or uh, or nasal bone fracture is seen in mid basal or level two, while um, hooding and of uh, course moon face appearance is seen in level uh, three. Of course, the battle sign is there, which is uh, bleeding around the mastoid area, okay, and the hooding. And of course, temporal bone, uh, of course, fracture is also seen, is seen in 20 to 30 percent. And those people, they come with uh, hearing loss instability and 80% are longitudinal and 20% are, are transverse and they, they could be also otic sparing. Of course, some of them, they come with sensorineural and hearing loss. The lower third is, of course, is mandibular fracture. And of course, these are features of mandibular fracture, uh, difficulty with chewing, malocclusion, numbness, facial asymmetry, and then in bilateral condylar fracture, the, the occlusion may be normal. Okay, and then while in condylar fracture, uh, one can use that to determine whether the individual sustained the fracture while the person's mouth was open or when it was closed, as we can see there. And of course, neck trauma, five to ten percent of serious traumatic injuries, and uh, um, a large chunk of them affect the anterior triangle. 95% of penetrating knock traumas, they are from guns and knives. And 5 to 6% of facial traumas, they have associated C-pine injury. Of course, uh, high velocity, they are more dangerous uh, and more uh, carries a high mortality. Okay, and the gunshot wound to the neck, surgery is indicated in 75% of cases, whereas 50% of stab wounds, they may require may require surgical exploration. Um, um, thrombosis is the most common complication of blood vessels injury, excluding, of course, transection, absolute transection. Um, transection of the major vessels, uh, that is, uh, it will lead to a severe bleeding, and it's a cause of, um, a severe, uh, of mortality in 80% of cases in battlefield medicine. Um, um, yes, uh, signs of laryngeal and tracheal injury, as we can see, voice alteration, uh, hemoptysis, that is coughing up blood, uh, stridor, and subcutaneous emphysema. Of course, hoarseness, tension, hematora, hematora, especially when the apex of the pleura in the neck is affected, and then upper airway obstruction, which is an emergency. Of course, signs of pharyngeal and esophageal injury, we can see it there, drooling, difficulty with swallowing, and crepitus. Um, uh, signs of carotid injury, decreased level of consciousness, contralateral hemiparesis, expanding hematoma, difficult breathing, and pulse deficit. Of course, um, a spinal cord injury and brachial plexus, quadriplegia, brown second syndrome, diminished upper arm capacity, uh, priapism and loss of vulvocavenous reflex, uh, poor rectal tone, urinary retention, neurogenic shock and hyperventilation. And of course, those are features of um, um, uh, cranial nerve uh, injury. Of course, the treatment generally follows the advanced life trauma life support, and uh, which is on the premise, premise of um, you treat the greatest threat to life. Okay, you irrespective of your diagnosis. So three quarters or four over five of battlefield deaths are from hemorrhagic or hypovolemic shock. I call home at all that is myself. We did a study on how to estimate weight in emergency setting uh, when you are to institute therapy. Of course, yes. at that time there is confusion. 
And so if without, if there is no simple formula, uh, the tendencies for you to over treat or under treat, or loose patients are there, which uh, uh, made us, uh, which informed that study, which is the first in medical literature. So primary survey, that is what we intend doing, uh, the concept of um, test hour, okay, the, the golden hour rule, of course, the Glasgow Coma Scale, the ABCDE of, um, of care. Of course, in the primary survey, you want to find out what are the uh, what are the things that threat, that are threatening life in such a, an individual? Is it a mass casualty? You're trying to separate those with a severe injury from those with uh, less severe injury. Then you go to secondary severe and tertiary severe, and where you can miss, uh, you can pick high chances of uh, misdiagnosis. So pre-hospital care is very critical uh, because time-sensitive illnesses such as cardiac arrest. Uh, stroke, um, uh, obstetric emergencies, mass casualty, as a road traffic accident, earthquakes, floods, like tsunami. You have a lot of people involved. Of course, without a, an effective pre-hospital care, uh, the mortality is very high. And that is why a study was done. It was found that a pre-hospital care, uh, care gives a reduction of 25% of mortality. Uh, which is it is added with effective transport and prompt hospital-based treatment. It improves to almost 75%. Of course, so an EMS, that's emergency medical services, is very critical, which is according to uh, WHO guideline. Of you course, have uh, two minutes left. Yes, uh, two minutes, yes. Of course, we have the concept of the platinum 10. The platinum 10, that is the first 10 minutes. Uh, of, of trauma or of injury. Uh, the first 10 minutes is very critical. You use the first one minute for primary survey. Then the next five minutes to stabilize and resuscitate the patient. The next four minutes to transport the patient to the next uh, medical center. It is key to success of outcome. And of course, multidisciplinary approach is there. Um, of course, the hospital care, you can see the, the protocol there, the phase, the concept of reconstructive ladder, the Gillis principle of reconstructive surgery, which means then that any tissue that is found in the scene of the injury should be picked. No tissue should be left uh, a lying fallow and then carried in, a, in an ice pack in case it might be needed. Then the Crane's principle of bayborne re, uh, revascularization. Of course, plastic, plastic surgery instruments should be used. Uh, in a penal loss of one third, close primarily, uh, lip one quarter, close primarily, uh, lead one quarter, close primarily. Of course, uh, open reduction or close reduction. And of course, these are some of the treatment modalities. This, that is a, a pan facial fracture that had mini plating. Uh, and of course, the neck injuries is the concept of selective versus mandatory. So which one do you do? Um, should you go and, uh, and find out whether you should do selective or every case that comes in? Of course, uh, fractured, uh, shattered larynx, you have to have instrument for emergency uh, airway restoration. Uh, of course, these are some of the complications. And of course, uh, rehabilitation, the use of processes, cochlear implant, facial implantation, and home care for long, lifelong uh, disability. Of course, outcome will depend on age, the degree of impact systems involved, the use of protective helmet, whether the person is a pedestrian or vehicular occupant, the availability of safe or appropriate pre-hospital care, subsequent hospital care, and availability of ICU. And that is the conclusion, prevention is better than cure, um, application of uh, appropriate laws, investment heavily on education and health and early surgical intervention and emphasis on condition, continuous uh, professional uh, development. Those are some of the pictures of road traffic crashes and injuries. And that is uh, the teardrop uh, phenomenon in, in uh, orbital blowout fractures. And that is a, a lateral uh, 
temporal bone fracture. We can see some of them here. Thank you for listening and God bless you all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniel yes. Kokong, for your informative Thank presentation. You. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. For the next opportunity, I would like to invite Dr. Desa Gede Agung Suprabawati, oncologic surgeon from the ICS Indonesia section. Uh, she will talk on the challenging oncologic surgical techniques. Dr. Desa Gede Agung Suprabawati, the floor is yours. Dr. Daniel Kukong, please take down your slides. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Take down the slide. Yeah, we're going to Thank you for the moderator. Uh, before I start, I want to say thank you for the FICS Indonesian section uh, that gave me the opportunity to be a speaker in this session. Also, thank you to Mr. Max Donham who attend this meeting. I would like to share my presentation. Yeah, uh, Dr. Daniel Kukong, uh, would you please... Yes take down the slides because uh, the next speaker could not uh, share screen if your yes. slides is still on. Okay. okay. It's, yeah, thank you. It's, it's not taken. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, can you see my presentation? Yes, vivid and clear. Okay. Uh, my presentation is the challenging oncologic surgical technique. Uh, so uh, here's what we will talk ab uh, about today. First, uh, we will talk about brief history in surgery, which includes milestone achieved in surgical oncology, our role as a surgeon in managing the disease, then we move to the evolution of diagnostic method which we know it plays a significant role in improving our way to manage the disease. Also our development in surgical techniques, and we will discuss a little bit about oncoplasty and reconstruction in surgical oncology. The history of surgical surgery in oncology itself cannot be separated by the history in surgery generally. And I think the more we know about the past, the more we can try to figure out where the future goes. It's always interesting to see that surgery uh, or intention of doing surgery, it goes back many thousand of years. In 10,000 uh, BC in Ukraine, trepanation was the first recorded attempt to do surgery. Then ancient Egypt uh, with their hieroglyph was thought to be some kind of circumcision up until uh, 600 BC by Hippocrates, who we know as the father of medicine, uh, who wrote about the various procedure. And as we go on, maybe we start to get uh, the names that sound more familiar at uh, 1500 AD evolution of modern surgical anatomy by Andreas Vesalius, followed by the invention of uh, modern anesthetic by William Morton. And after that, it rapidly developed after Joseph Lister invented the antiseptic solution. And up until now, it rapidly uh, evolving to robotic surgery area era. So what is surgical oncology? Surgical oncology is a field of oncology employing uh, surgical approaches to diagnose and treat cancer. And because the of the rapid development in medical science, molecular biology has a big impact on surgical oncology. And also the discovery about molecular profiling, such as uh, PCR, immunohistochemistry, uh, fluorescent insight to hybridization, and also microarray, 
make cancer treatment more personalized and tailor made to each patient. Here we can see uh, the example of molecular profiling that are common use in managing solid tumor such of uh, such as breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and thyroid cancer. In breast cancer, we we know uh, ERPR, HER2, KI67, ki BRCA1, two mutation. Uh, and then in colorectal cancer, we know Kiras and RAS, BRAF, HER2, NTRK fusion. Also in thyroid cancer, BRAF and NTRK fusion. Uh, all of this examination resulted targeted uh, and personalized treatment in hope to improve overall survival in cancer patient. So what is the role of surgical oncologist? Uh, so, so the role of surgical oncologist in imaging cancer patient. Every case is depend on how early the diagnosis can be made. Uh, in this case, either GP or surgeon itself can make the right diagnosis, including the states of the patient. So we can design the proper treatment for the patient. But unfortunately, in Indonesia, uh, we can say the most uh, patient come to our facility with uh, late or advanced states. So sometimes the only option is palliative management to the patient. And the most important thing is, uh, as we know, uh, in managing cancer patient, multidisciplinary team approach is the best option. Here as a surgical oncology, we must able be able to be a leader in multimodality care. Making a diagnosis in oncology uh, will always begin in a good history taking and physical examination, uh, include the disease progression, the invasiveness of tumor, the metastasis, and never forget to ask about the risk factor. And then uh, we continue to uh, order the radiology examination from the simple one, uh, like a plain X-ray, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and PET scan. Uh, and then uh, the gold standard uh, to diagnose the uh, oncologic patient is pathologic. Uh, pathology and immunohistochemistry examination. Uh, some of the uh, modality of the pathologic exam from the FNAB, uh, the advantage is less invasive, cost effective but this advantage is high non-diagnosis rate, insufficient specimen for immunohistochemistry. Core biopsy, uh, less invasive, high accuracy, but sometimes the pathological diagnosis are underestimated uh, due to a few specimen. And the, the newest, the latest uh, diagnostic uh, is a vacuum-assisted biopsy, less invasive, cost-effective, uh, high accuracy, good amount of specimens. And then this is the old uh, technique uh, that always we uh, perform before, uh, incisional biopsy and also excisional biopsy. The development of on technique in surgical oncology uh, in medicine field, especially in surgery field, uh, minimally invasive. Uh, in the, in the, and what about the surgery itself? Sorry, uh, here in this timeline uh, chart, we can see the development uh, on technique in surgical oncology. Uh, we have come a long way since the medieval era uh, until now, uh, from the Leonids in the medieval era, right? first description of excision of breast tumor uh, with cautery to stop the bleeding. Uh, I took the example from the breast cancer and then uh, now uh, we use the oncoplastic surgery to uh, close the defect uh, with uh, uh, brewing and warren 
describe first use uh, of a cellular dermal matrix based implant reconstruction of since uh, 2005. and development uh, on technique in surgical oncology in the past uh, i took the, the the example from breast cancer from radical mastectomy uh, and then radical mastectomy is remove not only the affective uh, breast but also the contralateral breast uh, all associated lymph nodes and the underlying pectoral muscle uh, from the musculoskeletal cancer Uh, four quarter amputation, amputation of the upper extremity uh, with its shoulder girdle and in the head and neck cancer, uh, uh, radical neck dissection uh, with removal of neck lymph nodes, sternocleidomastoid muscle and accessory nerve. But after development of radiotherapy and chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, the radical uh, operation uh, become less radical surgery. Uh, nowadays, with the development of technology in medicine field, especially in surgery field, minimally invasive technique also made it way to oncology surgery. In this timeline, we can see the development of minimally invasive of oncology surgery. It began uh, and rapidly evolved after the invention of anesthesia by Morton. Uh, and the first ever recorded laparoscopic surgery in human was done by Jacobus in 1910 and rapidly evolved until breakthrough in robotic surgery by Da Vinci system in early 2000. Uh, it's this. Uh, Minimally invasive oncology surgery can be done in various cases with the most uh, popular technique uh, done in digestive cases like cancer in the colon, liver, stomach, esophagus, etc. and gynecological cancer by using laparoscopic, transanal endoscopic microsurgery or natural orifice uh, transluminal endoscopic surgery. And in the lung cancer, Uh, we use uh, FATS, video assisted thoracic surgery, and uh, the thyroid cancer. Uh, we can use uh, TUTFA, transoral and endoscopic thyroidectomy vestibular approach. How about the robotic surgery? It's a novel technology uh, in minimally invasive surgery. It could provide better access in inaccessible operating area minimal scar, reduce blood loss, early recovery, minimum wound related complication so the patient uh, can uh, shorten uh, in the hospital stay. But the pros and cons, uh, the pros is a provide 3D image and better magnification of the structure. Uh, so the structure is easier identify, to identify. Uh, stable operating field and better maneuverability. But the controversial is a high cost uh, translation of immediate benefit resulting in long-term oncological outcomes and need a uh, learning curve. Being used to radical operation, sometimes uh, oncology surgery will leave a great amount of tissue loss. So sometimes in several cases, we need to perform a reconstruction surgery. There are uh, several ways to do reconstructive surgery. And this field also rapidly developed in the last decade. Uh, reconstruction, as we see in this slide, an algorithm that is usually used. So we can choose uh, the best method Uh, to reconstruct after doing some radical surgery. We can start from healing by secondary intention uh, until doing free tissue transfer, but each cases have their own uniques, so their method may be different. Uh, we can see from the this 
picture, uh, the timing uh, when breast reconstruction timing, immediate, option one, immediate reconstruction, uh, which perform uh, at the same time uh, as the mastectomy. Uh, I, I choose the example from the breast cancer, but uh, the delayed perform at a later time. The decision depends on uh, many factors, uh, breast cancer states, your medical condition, uh, your preference and lifestyle, additional therapies, uh, such as radiation, and uh, needed to treat the breast cancer. And option two is uh, immediate reconstruction uh, or delayed reconstruction uh, with advantages, decreased risk of social or emotional difficulties, uh, better cosmetic result, and possibly uh, fewer surgeries and lower surgery costs, no difference in rate of uh, development and of local cancer recurrence, no difference in the ability to detect local cancer recurrence, no significant delays in getting uh, other cancer treatment. And delayed reconstruction, the advantages is additional cancer therapy after mastectomy, such as radiation, does not cause problems at the reconstruction site and give patient more time to consider breast reconstruction option. Uh, reconstruction, as we see in this slide, is an algorithm. Uh, we can use the regional or pedicle flap. Uh, we can use the pectoralis major myocutaneous flap or supraclavicular artery island flap uh, to, to cover the defect in the head and neck uh, because it's uh, quite close uh, from the origin of the donor site. Uh, as we know, uh, pectoralis major myocutaneous flap is uh, versatile. It is usually used for the head and neck reconstruction. Another example for regional or pedicle flap is uh, LD flap, latissimus dorsi flap, and transverse uh, rectus abdominis uh, myocutan flap. Uh, these reconstruction methods are usually used for breast cancer cases and not only to close white defect but also maintain aesthetic, uh, aesthetic pro, uh, purpose because of the volume uh, that we can obtain by uh, this uh, the reconstruction. Another method uh, for reconstruction that gained uh, popularity since the microvascular surgery era is free flap. Uh, in free flap reconstruction, uh, we transfer the donor site uh, donor tissue to any recipient tissue and anastomosis their vascular by uh, microscope. It can be harvested from uh, radial forearm or anterolateral thigh flap uh, or ILT flap, but any free flap have their specific requirement. This is another example of free flap, also uh, fibula osteocutaneous flap. Uh, or rectus abdominis flap. Uh, I always say this quote in the end of my lecture of to my medical student, uh, sim uh, simply to explain that sometimes the biological characteristic of the cancer itself. So I quote uh, from the black candy, in the world of surgical oncology, biology is king, selection of cases is queen, and the technical details of surgical procedures are princess and princess of the realm who frequently try to overthrow the powerful forces of the king and queen, usually to no long-term avail, although with some temporary uh, vict apparent victories. Our uh, patient outcome is determined by its biological characteristic but, uh, of its cancer, but by a good surgical technique and done by experienced surgeons, 
we could achieve a good long-term survival of our patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Desa Giri Agung Suprabawati, for your nice presentation. Uh, before I open uh, the discussion session, I would like to invite Dr. Diaz Marawati uh, to provide some notes on the three presentations. Dr. Diaz Marawati, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Dear guests, thank you for attending the International College of Fortune, Indonesia Section Surgical Forum Chapter 14, Surgical Knowledge and Skill. All topics are interesting with a few thoughts on what we have learned this forum and how that fits into the overall events. Knowledge sharing is an important part of what we do. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Daniel Koko with the topic approach in facial cervical trauma. You're the important <clears throat> the important points are the, the face is intimately related to self image the bone of the facial skeleton are a key determinant of facial appearance the facial injuries demand attention because of their potential of long term impact on quality of life Maxillofacial fracture is typically caused by blunt facial trauma, the overall goal of management of craniofacial trauma. I would like to say thank you to Prof. Dodi Subadi with the topic challenging decision complex and high risk prostate disorder. The important points are PPH is the most common cause of lower causes, lower unirectric cases. History of PPH treatment from 1926 until 2013. The algorithm of surgical treatment, efficacy and risk in PPH treatment. The issue, medical versus surgical, TURP versus laser and MIST. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Desa Desa to get the Agung Suprapawati with the topic, the challenges of oncology surgical technology. The important points are history of surgical oncology, molecular profiling, role of a surgical oncologist, diagnosis in oncology, development on technique in surgical oncology, development of minimally invasive oncology surgery, and robotic surgery in surgery oncology. To conclude, let me just say that we all seek to innovate the surgical technology. And finally, congress and thanks to the steering committee and organizing committee for all of this hard work to make this happen. Well done all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Diaz Panawati, for the notes on the three presentations. And now we come to the discussion session. And the first part of the discussion session uh, will be the, the inter-speaker discussion. So each speaker uh, can ask question to the other speaker. So I will uh, invite for the first opportunity, Professor Dodi M. Subadi to ask question to the other speaker. Dr. Uh, Professor Dodi M. Subadi, the time is yours. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Uh, Peter. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kokong about the endoscopic approach for trauma in your field. Dr. Kokong, please react to this question. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, endoscopic approach. Um, Excuse me. Uh, could you adjust? Yeah. Could you adjust your position so that we can see uh, your face clearly? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, perfect. Am I clearly seen now? Yeah, perfect. Clear. All right. Yes. Yes. Uh, endoscopic approach is also uh, one of the approaches, and um, and then facial, facial cervical trauma. Um, 
especially when you are talking about um, um, rejuvenation or you're trying to do to refashion, you know, a scar, okay? Uh, because uh, at the time of injury, when there is a uh, bleeding, uh, the role of endoscopic surgery tends to be minimized at that time. So there is a role uh, of endoscopic surgery and the approach to facial cervical trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Kukong. Uh, for the next turn, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Daniel Kukong to ask questions to the other speaker. Uh, please, Dr. Daniel Kukong. Yes. Uh, thank you, um, the Dr. Uh, Peter Manoko, a wonderful person. And I want to even appreciate the repertoire. She did very well. She listened to all of us. Uh, basically, I do not have a question as such, but I want to appreciate um, uh, my two co-presenters. Uh, that is uh, uh, Professor Dodi uh, Subawadi and then uh, Dr. Supra Bawati. Um, you know, we are, we are two poles apart. I'm at the head and neck and he is at the prostate. Uh, so um, yes, prostatic uh, enlargement, um, uh, especially BPH, the new concept is uh, conservative, which he highlighted, a uh, conservative uh, management, medical treatment, because the issue of radical surgeries now is giving way uh, for minimally invas invasive surgeries. Uh, so Prof has done justice to that uh, topic. Um, um, Dr. Suprabhawati, yes, surgical oncology is an area that is very interesting and is very, uh, is evolving and um, uh, is an area that uh, needs a lot of um, patience because most of our patients come late, uh, which informs the radical surgeries that have been done. Um, in the ENT head and neck surgery, the head and neck surgery, the head and neck is a compact region, so there is no space, there is no tissue for you to play with. Uh, so since our sincere hope is a public awareness on a patient to, uh, to present early, uh, so that um, we will avoid radical surgery. Let's say, for example, radical mastectomy. You know, by the end of the day, the quality of life uh, to that patient, you know. And so I, I think um, generally our, our, our role now is, or our approach is to early detection, now, which is on patient's self-examination of the breast, uh, so that we will not reach the stage of uh, radical uh, surgeries. By and large, uh, it was a wonderful presentation by both the speakers, and I was excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your impression. So there is no question from Dr. Daniel Kukong. And for the next uh, turn, I would yes. like uh, to invite uh, Dr. Desa Gideagung Suprabawati to ask question to the other speaker. Dr. Desa, your uh, turn to ask question, please. Uh... I would like to uh, to ask with uh, Dr. Daniel Kokong. In multi-trauma uh, patient, uh, like a severe head uh, injury, uh, sometimes it needs so long uh, to stabilize the patient. And then we know that uh, in the uh, maxilla bone is a, a, a fast in healing. So how can we attack uh, to reconstruction if the patient uh, if the head uh, uh, sorry if the uh, neurosurgeon uh, still yes, care yes, about the, the patient uh, more than uh, two weeks thank you uh, yeah. Dr. Daniel Kukong yes. please react to this question uh, yes Th uh, thank you uh, Dr. Desak uh, Suprabhawati um, yes it is an interesting question and I have asked and that has been the problem that has been observed over the years, um, that many patients who suffer uh, facial trauma, facial and neck trauma with um, mid-facial fractures. Um, the initial approach is to restore life or to ensure that the person is kept alive first. And um, 
uh, because probably you know, the patient overload. So such patients are left and healing takes place. You have soft tissue and losses that was not adequately or appropriately treated. And then the patient is left to remain there for maybe two weeks or three weeks, as you said. And then when the real surgery for aesthetic, uh, you know, for aesthetics come in, uh, it now becomes another cause of another source of trauma. And that is why in this presentation, we advocate early approach to care within 24 to 74 hours, uh, 72 hours, sorry, 24 to 72 hours. Uh, we should be able to stabilize the patient. Um, once life, you know, the patient is stable, uh, we can invite the different uh, subspecialties, the maxillofacial surgeon, you know, to come up and then um, uh, to go ahead and uh, just open the wounds and then uh, do the plating. And then while the plastic are reconstructed or the facial cosmetic surgeon will come in and do his cosmetic surgery so that you know we avoid uh, causing another scar to the trauma scar so that is my own uh, uh, suggestion to that uh, and my own answer to that question thank you uh, super Bawad. thank you dr daniel kokong so uh and now i will open the second part of the discussion is uh, for the floor discussion any other question uh, from the floor you can ask the question directly I have a question to Dr. Daniel Kokong. Uh, in your experience, uh, did you do the management of the maxillofacial or cervical, uh, cervical facial trauma with a team that consists of uh, ENT surgeon, plastic surgeon, head neck surgeon, and oral surgeon? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Peter Johannes Manoko. Yes, that is what we do here. Okay, so the, we have a group of plastic surgeons, we have the maxillofacial surgeons, we have the ENT head and neck surgeons. Um, so the first thing we do is the, is the care at the accident and emergency. Okay, the accident and emergency. So once the patient is stabilized there, then the various specialties are called upon. Uh, I remember there was a case of a horn injury, a cow, um, someone went, uh, someone uh, that wanted to maybe sacrifice the cow or so, so the cow used his horn and then avoid the neck of the, the, the muscles of the neck. And so the ENT, so once immediately the patient was uh, stabilized, the ENT head and neck surgeon, they were called upon. And of course, um, they examined the neck and then lo and behold, the internal jugular vein was uh, the one that was transected. Uh, and of course, there was a judgment there. What do we do? Are we going to repair the vessel or are we going to ligate? Okay, so we went ahead and ligated the, the internal jugular vein and repaired the neck. So we have the collaboration here and uh, which makes uh, the outcome very impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel Kokong. Uh, any other question from the floor? Uh, I have a question to Professor Dodi M. Subadi. Uh, based on your experience, uh, to what extent you should make the conversion from the TURP or uh, the other uh, endoscopic surgery to the open surgery? Or uh, maybe you have a more specific data. Uh, how many percent of the endoscopic or TURP cases uh, was converted into the open surgery? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter. Uh, 
uh, on my data from 1984 until now, we didn't have uh, any conversion surgery from endoscopic to open for prostate surgery. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dodi. Uh, any other question from the floor? Can I ask a question, Dr. Peter? Oh, uh, you yeah, sure, please, Dr. Franz. Uh, to Professor Dodi, uh, Prof, uh, do you think that uh, with the advancement of medical treatment for uh, BPH, uh, and in your data, you said that uh, people are coming with a higher degree of obstruction and uh, uh, more hydronephrosis. <clears throat> uh, do you think it is too late to treat the, the prostate? Because uh, many, many doctors are treating it with uh, medical, uh, medically rather than uh, referring to a surgeon for uh, surgery. Yeah. Is it too late? You, your data shows that it's uh, like uh, we have hydronephrosis, we have high obstruction, something like that. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, more patients uh, prefer to have a delayed surgery. But nowadays, uh, I mean that in this uh, three or four years to up to now, the patient more rational that if the doctor explained that the risk is greater if you wait until you are uh, older, then the risk is more. Mm -hmm. Also, the uh, consideration for the insurance. Mm -hmm. Because uh, yeah, you, you, you can uh, explain to the patient that the TURP or the laser surgery, it could uh, for, uh, uh, durable for about uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if the patient is 65, then now they prefer more surgery than the uh, medic medical treatment. Thank you. Yeah, because if the patient gets older, then uh, the surgery will become higher risk. If, if he waits for another five years, maybe uh, he is not eligible for surgery. Right, right, right. <laughs> Very right. Thank you. But because I I see that uh, in now we, because uh, of the advancement of medical treatments, uh, many patients which uh, are naturally afraid of surgery uh, prefer to be treated medically first but sometimes it's get it gets over overrated so that the uh, these patients uh, don't come or uh, don't get the surgery at the proper moment or the proper time what is your advice for us i mean uh, when do you think it is uh, the best uh, cost benefits and cost effectiveness time for a uh, surgical approach in BPH? Yeah, most important is the follow up. Mm. So, the patient uh, with uh, medical treatment has to be followed up every year. And then you have a very good uh, <clears throat> uh, follow up that you can uh, see that how is the symptoms with the IPSS, International Prostate mm -hmm. Symptom Score the urophrometry, the PSA, the fold of the prostate, mm -hmm. then we can explain to the patient, uh, no, this is more progressive than I think. Mm -hmm. And I advise you to have a surgery now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Dodi. And another question for Dr. Desak. Is it possible, Dr. Peter? Sure, please. Okay. Yeah, with the advent of, uh, it is almost the same, actually. We, we, we see that uh, uh, some of the, tumors in the uh, colon and also in the uh, breast. Uh, there are research that shows that uh, non-surgical treatment is giving a good result. Perhaps in a very selected case. I have read the paper that sh says that in breast cancer, you can only radiate the cancer or giving radiation and uh, chemotherapy without surgery. So uh, what do you think is the this this condition now, Doctor Desak. We, we we are we are surgeons. We know that the best treatment for uh, solid cancer is uh, a surgery. surgery. Yes, mm -hmm. but but uh, there are a lot of opinion uh, outside uh, uh, surgical world that uh, now you can treat it with this with uh, radi radiation, maybe with ablation, with uh, 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 chemotherapy only. And they, they reported it, it has a good result. 
And this is an option that's already given to many of our patients, which uh, um, perhaps, in my opinion, delays their, their proper management, which is uh, surgery. Okay. Yeah, please, Dr. Desa. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Franz. Uh, the problem is if uh, only use the radiation or uh, chemotherapy, we never know about the but a pathological complete response. Maybe this is the only the temporary result, yeah, because we never know about the uh, the long term uh, effect uh, of the using only uh, radiation and chemotherapy uh, 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 only. But uh, if we we still use the jargon, is the solid tumor is. Uh, Surgery is the uh, the best option, but uh, that's that's my opinion about that. Mm -hmm. But because we don't know about the pathological complete response, uh, if only using the radiation and uh, chemotherapy only, mm -hmm. uh, or thank hormonal you. therapy. Thank you, Dr. Desa, for your uh, explanation. Uh, any other question? Maybe the last question from the floor. Uh, well, I think uh, we have arrived in the in the end of this surgical forum, and I would like to invite Mr. Max Downham to provide uh, some notes from the headquarter uh, based on these three presentation. Mr. Max Downham, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manopo. I, it, the three presentations, uh, as well as the comments from Dr. Asmarani, uh and the introductory by uh, Dr. Hindarto, uh, they're uh, ex excellent presentations. Uh, as you all know, or if you don't know, I will tell you that I'm a lay person. I'm not really qualified to, in many respects, to judge the presentations otherwise. Um, but I think they're very interesting. I think the history of surgery uh, by Dr. Suprawati uh, uh, is, I think, uh, very, very interesting. It brings to mind uh, a thought that I is one of my favorites, which is that um, um, there is uh, no constant or maintaining of the status quo in life. Uh, the only uh, constant is change. And I think uh, based upon the three presentations today in terms of surgical knowledge and skills, there has been not just significant change, but very, very dramatic change. And it brings me to the open-ended uh, kind of rhetorical question that probably no one, well, we don't have time, but no one has the time to or uh, can predict. And that is if we were sitting together 10 years from now, uh, all of us congregated as we are now, uh, what would we, you know, what would be the techniques and what would be the state or the status of knowledge? Uh, I can only imagine, uh, as again, as a layperson, that it would be dramatically different, uh, which is the fascinating part uh, of these uh, sessions. So to all the speakers, Dr. Kokang, uh, Dr. Sabardi, Dr. Supra Bawati, uh, and Dr. Asmarani, uh, uh, thank you so very, very much. Uh, it's a privilege and honor for me to be part of this and to for you, Dr. Manopo, to invite me to make comments. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Max Downham. Uh, dear participants and all the speakers, uh, Professor Daniel Kokong, from the ICS Nigeria section, and Mr. Um, Max Downham from the headquarter of the ICS. The other speakers, Professor, Professor Dodi M. Subadi, uh, Dr. Desa Kriyakung Suprabawati, Dr. Dias Marawati, Dr. Franz Arifin, Professor Hendi Hendarto, and also to our team, IT of the ICS Indonesia section, Mr. Bimo and uh, Ms. Dewi. I would like uh, to express my gratitude uh, 
on behalf of the ICS Indonesia section. Uh, we will meet uh, next month in the same forum with other topics and other speakers. Thank you very much. Keep healthy and well. Good evening and see you later. Goodbye. Yes, good, Thank you. good afternoon from Nigeria. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Kokong. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for all the participants and all the audience. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Desa. Bye. Yeah.